My name is Raj Kumar. I'm the president and editor in chief of DevX. Uh, DevX, I think many of you know, is the media platform that covers global aid and development. Uh, we've got about a million readers around the world, people like yourselves, aid workers and development professionals. And uh, during this week, we've got 10 of our 100 reporters from around the world actually here in New York. This is our, our busiest week covering everything that goes on at the UN General Assembly and the Clinton Global Initiative and so many other important events like this one that are happening. And there's no shortage of top-tier issues that people are talking about this week. But if you were to make a list of what are the big challenges facing the world, it's hard to imagine that the topic we're here to discuss would not be somewhere right near the top. And that is basically how to feed the world. We're here to talk about staple crops. Um, there are enormous challenges and there are enormous opportunities. And it's kind of hard to know where we are. I personally feel pulled in both directions. So I'm looking forward to hearing more from our panelists who work in this every day where we're heading on, this, on these key issues. Uh, for those of you who were at the Clinton Global Initiative yesterday for their closing plenary, uh, after many days of hearing about a lot of the challenges, we heard from uh, Peter Diamantis, who's the founder of the X Prize, some of you may have heard of. Um, and Peter is also the author of a book called Abundance. And he was talking about how there's going to be vertical farming and skyscrapers in downtown Manhattan, and you know the, that they're developing new uh, crops that can photosynthesize at 300% more efficiency. And he was just so positive about the the, the positive benefits of technology and where we're heading, so optimistic that it was hard not to walk out of that thinking, wow, we're really heading in a, to a great place. But then, of course, we look at the recent past. We've had food price shocks. We know there's not that much more land in the world that we can use for agriculture without tearing down forests and hurting the environment. We have this, this tension between climate change and increased productivity. And in many places in the world, yields just ha aren't really moving. So. Uh, we want to get into some of this today. We want to talk about the technology. We want to talk about the policy. We want to talk about the funding for research that important organizations uh, like those represented here today are engaged in. And we've got this great panel to, to talk about it. I've just met them for the first time a minute ago. So I'm not going to tell you their life story. I'm going to ask them for a little bit of their background. But just to tell you who we have, we've got David Watson. Uh, David is, in addition to the fact that he's the program, he leads the program on maize at uh, CGIR, uh, program on maize at CIMIT is the correct pronunciation, I think, of the, of the entity that you work at. But you've just gotten off a plane from China. So um, I've always said that being jet lagged is like being drunk without the alcohol. So I'm hoping that we're going to hear some really interesting, provocative comments from David. Uh, we have uh, Her Excellency Tumisime Ronda Peace, who I think many of you heard, had the pleasure of hearing upstairs. I, I unfortunately missed it. I just got here. But she is the Commissioner for Agriculture and Rural Development at the African Union. So I think no, known well to many of you. Uh, we have Tim uh, Searchinger, who's, who's here from Princeton, where he's at the Woodrow Wilson School uh, and also at the World Resources Institute as a senior fellow. Thank you, Tim, for being here. And uh, of course, have Natalie Rosenblum. But remind me what your, the name is I'm supposed to Dina Kona. Dina Koa. Dina Koa, okay. Uh, Natalie Dina Koa from Monsanto, where you're Vice President for Sustainability. Thank you as well for being here. And then last but not least here from Montreal, uh, Claudia Ringler, who is at uh, IFPRI, and she's in the Environmental and Production Technology Division and a Deputy Director there. Uh, so thank you again, all of you, for being here. I, I wonder, maybe David, you can start us off um, and get us going on this kind of broad topic of, of staple crops. We know, given that the world population is set to grow substantially. We're heading to 8 to 10 billion people, 9.6, I guess, is the consensus view. Um, we certainly do not have, although there's a lot of wastage of food, there's, there's currently not enough in the system to feed all of these people. We're looking at how do you double staple crops. Um, is that something we're going to be able to do? And what does the path look like to getting there? Well, as, as far as, is the mic working? Tell me. Yes. Oh, well, you can hear anyway. Hopefully you can hear in the room. Um, is the mic working? I know we've got people joining us from... You want it higher? Yeah, we've got people joining us from the live stream in addition to those in the room. And by the way, while you're adjusting your mic, as yeah, a result of that, that. Uh, apologies if I keep us moving and interrupt people to get, keep the conversation going. And if you're using technical language, I might ask you to explain it since we are, we're hopefully being joined by lots of people uh, online who may not be as familiar. But please go ahead, David. Take it away. I mean, as, as far as the, the doubling question is, is concerned, um, you know, maybe that's a, a little bit extreme. We're looking probably at 60 to 70 percent increases um, over the next uh, 20, 30 years. 
Um, it is possible with significant and sustained investment. Um, partly that can be done through plant breeding um, and, and, and major advances have already been made in, in plant breeding and in new approaches to plant breeding. Um, part of the gap that we have, part of the challenge, can be addressed also by improving agronomic uh, practices, um, more sustainable systems, more high um, productivity systems. Another, and I don't want to steal everybody's... No, go ahead and okay. steal it, steal it. They will. Another, another <laughs> aspect isn't, isn't just producing more, having the, the genetics there to produce more and the agronomy to produce more. It's about being able to, to save and, and manage what you've produced. So mm -hmm. reducing crop losses, which can be significant um, in many areas, including, uh, you know, maybe 25, 30 percent in certain parts of, of Africa. And also improving the quality of those foods. There's a lot of deterioration, quality deterioration occurs after, after harvest. Mm -hmm. So significantly in increasing global yields and, and product, uh, production <coughs> is certainly possible. And, and you think it's possible while keeping in mind the resource limitations? Yeah, no, we, I mean the, the resource limitations are some of the, the most important factors, uh, particularly climate change, whether it's uh, increasing heat, whether it's reduced water rainfall and erratic rainfall, increased fertilizer uh, prices, um, lack of uh, phosphate uh, reserves, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They are all challenges, but they should be. Um, we should be able to meet them with sustained investment in, in our FD and uh, proper extension. Tim, how, how do you feel about this? Do you do you agree with this in general? Are we going to be? Maybe we'll get to that end result, but the pathway there is going to have lots of ups and downs. How do you see the the road ahead? Well, the first thing is uh, you can always produce the food you need if you're willing to cut down all the world's remaining forests to do it. So the challenge, the real difference is that now we don't want to do that anymore. And so um, I mean, on a global basis, uh, our analysis is that if you wanted to produce all the food the world needs by 2050 from all crops, not just staple crops, um, without increasing land area, you would need to achieve a rate of yield gain across all crops that's about 30% higher than the last 50 years. Well, that's a big challenge. Mm -hmm. Because the last 50 years, you've doubled irrigation, you brought scientifically bred seeds to most of the world, uh, you brought fertilizer to most of the world, um, and you say, we obviously don't have the same type of kind of brute force techniques available to us. <coughs> now, having said that, in the case of staple crops, unless we produce a lot of biofuels, we actually don't need to achieve, the biggest growth is in non-staple crops. But that's actually a good thing, because we've also done, in many parts of the world, as much as we can, or not as much as we can, but we've done, we're reaching yield plateaus in much of the world on staple crops. So we don't have to do, um, you know, if staple crops can do as well as they've done historically, that will be, they'll be doing their share. Can, can you explain that a little bit? Are you saying that we really have enough production of staple no, crops no, 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 if no. it's we need distributed to... right, or if we stay at the current no. No. rate? If we, if we manage to match the historic rate, okay. that would be okay, whereas for other crops, we need to even go beyond the historic rate. But, of course, it doesn't really matter. We only have so much cropland, so whatever you can, wherever you can get your yield gains, you want to get them. And, and of course, it's going to be hard in staple crop area because, we, as I said, we don't have those brute force techniques. So what does that mean? What we can do is we can do everything smarter. So all of the things that make the economy, uh, give the economy new opportunities because of our knowledge and efficiency abilities, every, in every other sector of the economy also applies to agriculture. So whether it's the biological techniques that are now available for crop breeding, whether it's more precision agriculture, whether it's simply not taking resources for granted and actually applying taking advantage of all of the land, not writing off whole sectors of agriculture. We have to do better in all of those. So yeah, I, 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 nobody knows. Uh, I'm modestly uh, optimistic, but only because we have to take advantage of all of these more imperceptible improvements in technology um, 
and I think we probably can do that. I think there's a lot of potential, but it's not going to happen unless there is a much renewed effort. I want to get into that effort in, in a minute, but Natalie, I wanted to go to you and get, get a chance to hear your reaction to this. Uh, do you see it the same way these two gentlemen do? Well, thanks for the chance to be here, and uh, I'd like to congratulate the CG system for their leadership in all of the UN events that happened over the last week, because it put a lot of attention in places that we needed a lot of attention. Um, for those not familiar with Monsanto, we're a company completely focused on agriculture. Um, we have four core crops. Uh, corn, maize, uh, soybeans, cotton, and canola. And we're also the largest vegetable seed company in the world. And about 50% of our business is actually in international markets. So I know a lot of folks associate us with uh, large-scale farming, but we also serve at least probably half or more of our customers are smallholder farmers around the world. And our real focus is on we succeed when farmers succeed and trying to develop the kind of tools and information that they need to be, to be successful. And in this area of doubling food production, that's an area that we think is really important uh, for a number of crops. And I agree that in certain crops it's, it's a bigger challenge than others um, based on where, where, they're coming, where they're starting from today. Um, but we really feel that it's very important that there's no trade-off here, that you have to be producing more while conserving resources at the same time. And that's really what um, a big part of what sustainability means for us as a company. Uh, sustainability has lots of different definitions for people, but um, the definition we go by is really understanding what are the issues that society and our customers care about that our business touches and that touch our business that can provide risk or opportunity for our business and trying to understand what role can we play. And for a long time, I think a lot of companies sustainability was sort of like corporate social responsibility and their philanthropy, which has its place, it's, and it's an important place. Um, but more and more, I think you see the, the private sector really focusing on sustainability as an engine for business growth, a real driver for their business, which means leveraging the power of their business towards these societal outcomes where you have the win-win. And that's where we're putting a lot of our efforts. And so we've had um, a lot of traditional investment in breeding, which we're continuing, in biotechnology, which we're continuing, but now we've really started to explore two new, two new um, R&D platforms, one being the biologicals that Tim mentioned, and also precision agriculture. And a lot of that precision agriculture is about really getting farmers a lot of the information that they need um, to, to be more productive and, and to use the seed and the, and the other inputs they have more effectively. And so that's where I go back to this doubling while well, conserving resources idea, um, particularly when we talk about smallholder systems. There's a lot that can be done with the tools that farmers have if they have more information and, of course, a holistic approach that's recognizing they need access to the market and all of those kind of pieces. So um, that's the approach that we take for, towards it. We're very optimistic that this is possible, mm -hmm. but we do believe it will take an unprecedented level of... Um, access to innovation and collaboration than we've really seen before. And for um, farmers to have access to existing tools as well as emerging tools that fit for their operations. Do you see that collaboration coming together? I mean, I imagine a lot of the organizations represented on this panel are exactly the sorts of groups that need to collaborate. Is it happening yet at the scale you think we're going to need to get to the doubling of production? I think it's starting, but I actually don't think it's... I think the ones on the panel, we've done a pretty decent job collaborating. It's the people not on the panel. Like who? Like who? Um, like the health and wellness community. Like uh, the environmental community. And that, in my opinion, in the last couple of weeks, there's been more of a convergence um, than I think we've seen before where you have more um, different sectors and that part of what that brings is developing in developed country kind of agriculture together as well and thinking through this um, more globally. And so I, I was really happy in the last week between the Clinton Global Initiative meetings and the UN meetings that I felt there was more discussion between the social scientists community, like I said, the, the nutrition and even medical community, the environmental community and those that have been working more around hunger and food security. Great, thank you. Rhonda, uh, I want to get your perspective on this broadly, and I wonder, you know, you represent the African Union, thinking of the countries involved here from the government perspective, do they share these views? Are they looking out in the same way at the future? Uh, how do they, if they were here on this panel, 
I'm asking you to speak for a lot of governments. How, how might they react to this discussion? Well, I think this question is extremely important because uh, um, for us in Africa, we see it being very closely uh, related to what I was speaking to actually this morning earlier on. Uh, we have, of course, uh, to, to look at uh, doubling our production and productivity by 50%, which is very ambitious on our part. But I think this is also the targets we have, which the, the leaders have set themselves to doing. So I believe it is achievable, but then it takes a lot uh, to, uh, for it to be, uh, to be done. Uh, as you know, uh, the increase in production uh, in Africa has been uh, on scale. Uh, it has been increasing uh, the land uh, rather than increasing productivity. So this one has to be looked in uh, rather intensively. The technologies are available, of course. But then also we have uh, other challenges, uh, including the policy frameworks, which have to be changed. We have to look at the issues related to land, these issues which we have been talking about. There's a lot of land degradation. So getting a land and the deg uh, degradation uh, neutrality, uh, which is, of course, is going to be one of the MDG, uh, the SDG now uh, under discussion as a target. So we are looking at really efficient use of water, uh, water management, soil and uh, land management. We are looking at the ICTs. And these are technologies which are already developing when you go, for example, to Kenya, there is a lot of use of uh, technology informing the farmers. You can do, if it can be stepped up, in extension systems, I think it can be done. But then uh, over the years, uh, say the last 30 years, we know that agriculture in Africa, when you look at it, has been increasing steadily, steadily, indicating that uh, if some effort is put in and which uh, uh, is, is likely to be now that there is a lot of uh, kind of convergence in ideas and in uh, thinking uh, on the technical, on the, lead, on the policy frameworks, I think it can be done. To what degree is it getting to the smallholder farmers today? I think Natalie was referring to this. Maybe there's still a big opportunity in some ways for those who are not using advanced seeds, not using fertilizer. How, how far have we come in getting more modern agriculture techniques to smallholder farmers? Well, you know, the small scale farmers uh, are risk averse, but now there's attention, increasing attention uh, towards marketing, marketing systems. And also investment, investments uh, which, can, which directly impact on the, on the small scale farmers are also increasing. Uh, of recent, we have seen that uh, the governments are putting in their own resources. It's, their own resources are on the increase on the continent, which is very positive. And then in that regard also, we have seen that the partners are also coming in supporting uh, the governments. And this money is going uh, really directly to uh, the farmers, the small-scale farmers. We are looking at, of course, how we can facilitate the small-scale farmers to work with the bigger farmers so that uh, where there are gaps, there are market failures, then those can be bridged in uh, by the other medium and large-scale farmers. So uh, generally, we look at a uh, kind of tripling tripling the current production levels. And in agriculture, especially staple foods, it's very doable. Very doable, okay. Claudia, do you, do you feel the same way? Or is it very doable? <laughs> See, that's a very general statement. <laughs> Things are what would doable. make it doable? What okay. would make it doable? I think we would need a significant reinvestment and reallocation of the resources uh, in the agricultural sector. So we need much better targeting of agricultural technologies we need much, much stronger investment in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, for example, under you know, business as usual, Sub-Saharan Africa, Middle East, North Africa, South Asia will have to import much more staples than they've done before because they have not been able to generate the productivity. They will not be able to generate the productivity under current investment levels and under current agriculture R&D levels. We also need much more sustained investment in agricultural research. So we have seen a stagnation, absolutely no improvement during the 1990s, which basically means a fallback um, in future productivity growth. We have seen improvements in the 2000s, 
So we have seen a 22% increase in public um, agricultural research spending. But given that population, food demands, dietary change, everything is growing very rapidly, this is really not enough. And it might be enough if it's sustained. But we've, after that, we've had the financial crisis. We have a lot of other crises, and people and governments are reinvesting their monies elsewhere again. So I think we are certainly not, uh, we're not on a pathway to sustainable agricultural growth at this point. Um, and and oh, I've been speaking for public investment. Of course, private, um, private investment in agricultural research has been, incre has been increasing more rapidly uh, than public funding in agricultural research. It's very important. But the public sector is the only sector you know, that directly supports the poorest countries. And those are the ones who have completely failed and continue to fail in investing in agricultural research. The gains have been made in China, Brazil, Argentina, some in India. These countries actually now show you know, somewhat faster productivity growth. But those countries who have failed to invest fail to show productivity growth. So we definitely need to do a lot. Second, it's absolutely, I believe, impossible to achieve the, uh, the needed uh, growth in staples without further degrading the environment. It's just not possible. We are on a trajectory where we will further degrade the environment. So we just need much stronger, we really need stronger investment and a stronger dedication by everyone to make agriculture, you know, increase water productivity, energy productivity, land productivity, labor productivity. We need to work all together and across all the sectors. In the past, you know, we just focus on yield improvement and the rest, climate change, um, biofuels, energy prices, it didn't matter. But now it's all correlated, integrated, and if we you know, one small problem on the energy market, and we will again see problems in the food sector as well. So basically, we are much more on edge than we were like 10, 15 years ago. Um, and I think agriculture investment has taken note and there has been some improvement, but I haven't seen, I have not seen commitments where governments say we will really see that through and we will take it through to the next 20, 30 years. I haven't seen that. A question maybe for what the message to governments should be. It sounds to me like we're in such a fragile state that we're very likely to see another food price spike. Sure. Do you, you feel yes. that way? Yes, we will. I mean, climate variability, climate extremes, you know, I, I mean, the volatility has certainly increased. The food price volatility has increased. And yes, we will see. I mean, I think it's uh, impossible to not see um, future food price, uh, f you know, future food price crisis that then will again affect the poorest the most. It doesn't mean that people will go hungry everywhere. But we will certainly, we will see more crisis. And I, I think that's, it's going to happen. Yeah. Please, Tim, go ahead. It's no accident that the uh, staple crop prices have come down after a couple of years when there's been no growth in U.S. corn ethanol and uh, 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 basically no growth in biofuels. Europe has been at the same level. Brazil has come down. And what that does is it allows agriculture to catch up to the increase in demand. And what people misunderstood about the role of biofuels in the recent price rises is it's not the absolute level, it's the rate of growth. So you get these long-term equilibrium models that say, well, of the long term, the price rise should only be this, if you have this much. But when you have rapid growth, people can't keep up. You get a shortage situation. So that's you know, a huge factor right now. If you all of a sudden went back into a large scale of biofuel growth, I would expect you wouldn't keep up again and you would um, you would have large, large price spikes. And if I can offer one more statistic on that. So we've done a very simple calculation. Um, you know, a lot of countries have a goal of 10% liquid transportation fuel from biofuels by 20, uh, 2020. To produce 10% uh, of that, you would need a third, not a third, 30% uh, of all the crop calories produced in all the world's crops as of 2010. That's assuming you're using crops well, and, and, as opposed yeah. to cellulose or other... Yeah, but we're not going to use cellulose by 2020. Uh, and, and then on top of that, <coughs> if you use cellulose on cropland, you don't necessarily earn better off. So it gives you some idea of the magnitude of that. And, and, and this has a big effect on the, on the scope of the challenge. When you see figures that say we need a 100% increase in staple crops, that, a lot of that is supposed to go into biofuels. You can hold that to a more manageable level of 50-60% increase, this is from 2006 to 2050, if you're only doing food. Now that's still huge, that's still a huge challenge, but you can get some idea of the, 
of the difference uh, that you're talking about. It, yeah, I mean, that, it, cool. basically, uh, Dave Watson's challenge becomes um, a little bit more manageable. Right. Back to the question of what's doable, it sounds yeah. like that would be doable under that scenario. Um, it, this is obviously a place where politics and government policy plays a huge role. So, Tim, can I just follow up on that? Uh, do governments get that? Do you feel like the message is out there that there is a trade-off if they continue to push for this policy? A little bit. Part of the problem is that numbers get thrown around in this kind of strange way. And you mentioned this uh, talk of the uh, Clinton Global Initiative. We have to have a kind of a, an, a, a, an appropriate level of optimism. I mean, I look at all, I'm not a, an agronomist. I look at the explosion of biological techniques. I talked to Dave about the things in the pipeline, and I'm optimistic. What does it mean to be optimistic? It means that I think if, if, if people followed what Claudia said to do and exploited all of the abilities that Dave's group has, we can probably come close to feeding the world without chopping down massive amounts of new forest. We probably have to chop down some, particularly in Africa, where the growth, you know, the African population, sub-Saharan African population, is supposed to grow from 900 billion to 2.1 billion by 2050. So that's a huge challenge. So I'm optimistic that we can, if we really do a great job, we can kind of avoid the worst problems. But if you hear these kind of exalted claims like, ah, you know, basically the food will produce itself, we're going to produce it in high rises in New York City, absolute complete nonsense. Um, you know, then you get this completely warped view of, of the challenge, and people forget. They get, so don't go, it's important to be optimistic, but have some realism to the optimism, or you end up making these, these really distorted uh, policies. You jump from kind of doom to, you know, extreme, you know, <laughs> optimism. I mean, well, we have to have, like, moderate optimism. Right. <laughs> well, and I think to make some of these new models economic, requires price levels that are dramatically higher than what we have today. So, you know, maybe it does become economic to grow food in downtown New York, well, but at what price level? We hope not. Right? <laughs> exactly. There, there is a trade-off there. Uh, we, you've, you've all been touching on this topic of importation, so I want to bring that back to Rhonda to, to ask your thoughts on this, Rhonda. Do you think, are we, are we, excuse me? Rhoda, excuse me. Our, I guess I got the wrong name written here. Uh, Rhoda, do you think we are heading to a point where there's simply going to be no choice but to dramatically increase importation in sub-Saharan Africa? Is that where we're going, or is that the policy today? Well, uh, <clears throat> earlier on, I, I really articulated the areas which uh, uh, governments have said we must focus on this one, we must focus, focus on this one. They have set 2025 20, to end hunger uh, on the continent. And to do that, it takes a kind of strategic approach. And this, and this is what they are doing now. In fact, we have seen a lot of uh, growth in agriculture uh, productivity. And also recent studies have, have indicated this one. In fact, we undertook uh, several studies in Ethiopia, in Rwanda, in Ghana, in Burkina Faso. We have seen that uh, uh, there is a lot of improvement in as far as uh, uh, production and productivity is concerned. Of course, investment in research may not have been commensurate with what should have been done. Definitely, investment in research has, has not been growing. But investment in agriculture is growing uh, day by day. And we see that countries are investing extremely <coughs> seriously. We have uh, what we call national agricultural investment plans, and these are articulated uh, at the round table by different actors. And research people are also uh, a part of that one. And if they were coming in and articulating the areas of their emphasis, they would also be sharing in those resources. So I think that round table is very, very important. So I see that uh, the countries have set themselves targets, which, as economists say, other things being constant, they are definitely going to move there. And Earlier on, when we are breaking in the morning, as, as somebody asked a question, which we have to be, be thinking all the time when we are discussing, how are we going to, to be uh, holding ourselves accountable? Every two years, each country is going to be brought to check, just say, uh, tools are being developed indicate, to indicate where we are and where we are. In two years' time, where are we? And then countries will be held accountable. Just say, 
you were here, now you are still here. So that they are reminded, they are reminded of what is happening. So there is a lot of movement and there is a lot of dynamism which is going on in Africa. And we believe that uh, uh, if this, is, this trend is really taken on, which I believe countries are now seriously looking at, it's now it's like competition. You find that uh, when this country is doing well, then you hear another one now taking over. This one is very good. And later on, I, I believe that the, 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 uh, the plenary also is going to speak. You will speak. Uh, there is, uh, for example, the former minister of agriculture in Rwanda. She may be, she can talk from example, looking from the grassroots to see what is happening at the country level. So uh, we need to get out of uh, our centers and be out there and see what is happening and then respond to what they really need in order to move and run fast. Do you think the level of urgency that we've heard now from Claudia and Tim, is, is that reflected at the government level? Do people get that level of urgency that things need, these decisions need to be made now? Otherwise, there will be no choices, <laughs> no good choices at least in a few years. Around the table, I had a bit of pessimism, and I was worried. I, I thought that maybe uh, we need to be to, to be together more and more. In fact, earlier on, I was thanking Scott here, just say thank you for inviting us, so that we tell the story of what is happening, because now there is thirst, thirst for this, thirst for knowledge, thirst for uh, what it takes. Uh, for value chain development, because the farmers cannot really continue to produce. We are no longer focusing on increasing production and productivity, no. We are focusing on how do we take the entire uh, chain of the values so that we are able to ensure that uh, we are now moving. We have set targets of agri-food systems, and they are, th th that one also is going to have uh, uh, checks. We have a resource framework. Results from work where each party is going to be held accountable on what you are going to be doing. And we are working with partners, we are not working alone. So we would like to see how the CGI institutions also are moving together with us. Now Dave, maize is obviously a major staple in Sub-Saharan Africa. How do you see it specifically from the perspective of maize? Does this conversation ring true there? Do you feel there's some some peculiarities or differences that, that, that you want to bring up? I think, I think in general there's a, there's a lot of congruence there. Um, the question about imports versus uh, really domestic production, yeah. I think that's, that's pretty key and I don't think it is uh, an either or. You know, trade has been a, an important <laughs> balancer and, a, a, and an economic um, dimension for you know for, for, for many 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 years um, and I think that will continue but you can't rely the globe can't rely on imports you know imports have got to be grown somewhere mm -hmm. and when you look at some of the the developed world bread baskets productivity is increasing only very very slowly there they're again facing other environmental constraints so um, you know they, there isn't just an, an unlimited supply of, of food that you can import. So there's got to be a little bit of a balance. There's got to be homegrown productivity increases plus that flexibility of, of, of importation. Claudia, please. Yeah, just also on the net imports versus, um, you know, should I restrict them and focus on domestic production? <coughs> Fully agree with Dave and uh, also Tim. For sure, we do want very stable, very open trading system. It's the main buffer in terms of, uh, for long term climate change, climatic shocks, other shocks. Um, I, the only countries that you know should maybe consider to to openly rely on net food imports rather than trying to produce it themselves is the Gulf countries because they've really mm -hmm. more or less completely drawn down their groundwater resources. Mm -hmm. I've seen a statistic last week presented by Qatar that in four years they run out of acceptable groundwater. Exactly in 2018. So it's they then have calculated it, but they continue to irrigate. So, um, you know, and those countries can afford to feed their population with imported food. They don't have to worry about not having financial resources. Africa, the key is obviously domestic productivity improvement, so not, not an open policy to import the food, but of course keep trading channels open. Um, investments in agriculture have been shown to you know, reduce poverty three times more than any other investments, particularly in Africa. 
We have a lot of rapidly growing world population, as we heard, uh, 2.1 billion people in 2050 cannot be absorbed fully by urban areas. So we need really rapid uh, productivity improvements in, in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And that's one of the key challenges. And again, it will have some adverse environmental impacts. Obviously, there are technologies, there are management practices that, you know, that we should focus on to, to reduce adverse environmental impacts. But we can't just say we can do it without um, affecting the environment. This I think we have to be clear. Africa is actually a large net exporter of agricultural products by value. We forget about this. It's yeah, import it's staples, right. but actually exports three times as much as its imports. And, and, it, and it uses, we calculated once, it uses about 12% of all of its cropland for those cash crops. So, and I think there has a lot of growth potential in that. I don't, you know, these people who kind of make fun of you know, growing flowers in Kenya. I think growing flowers in Kenya is a great idea. You know, you can make a lot of money. And, and so I don't think we should, we, should, we should put that behind. I mean, Africa, you know, has a lot of triumphs, African agriculture, and it's been, anyone has to be encouraged. If you've seen what's going on now, it, yield growth have started again, you have the potential for a virtuous cycle. So there is reason for optimism. Uh, again, you just don't want to go too far. You have to remember the scope of the challenge and stop, therefore, you know, planning your celebration prematurely. Right. Natalie, how, how do you see this? I wonder if this was, you're the only private sector representative. If it, if it was the other way around, would we be having a somewhat different conversation? How might it be different? Well, um, I think in terms of food or fuel, we look at it as we're really going to need both, and this is going to be a really a, a huge challenge for all of us. And talking to some of my um, colleagues and farmers around the world, they don't really want their food production to, to be dependent on U.S. energy policy. They want their own productivity to be increased, and that's where we're trying to focus some of our efforts on really helping to increase that. And I actually think this is an exciting time where Africa is being recognized for the first time in a while, at least that I've been working with, you know, and really being involved in Africa and uh, other parts, other smallholder areas. Africa's being seen as you know, some of the fastest growing economies and real opportunities for business development. Um, I think a number of companies, my own included, have taken a really hard look at what's the opportunity there and what can we do there. And my vision is that um, you know, I'm, I'm very inspired by the smallholder farmers I've met around the world and their resiliency. And I want to be able to bring agricultural systems that equal that resiliency for them. And I really aspire to a, a situation where there's a very vibrant private sector that's giving them lots of choices, and we have to compete to earn their business. And I think that's an important part of the equation. It will take time, and it's going to take a lot of collaboration to get there. And, and whatever the balance is of public and private sector, we need to be keeping in mind all those holistic approaches that we heard this morning around you know, um, the social science, what do these farmers really want and need, and, and how does this fit into the agricultural landscape, and there's a lot of information that we still need to inform as we're doing this growth. But, but I think there's more and more of the private sector really looking to Africa that way. And, um, and one, I wanted to, to talk a little bit about one of the projects that the CG system has been so instrumental in, a partnership that we've been working on, that I think is a very important stepping stone to getting to that level of private sector engagement in Africa. And that's, um, it's called the Water Efficient Maze for Africa Project. CIMIT is um, a major partner in terms of all of their breeding expertise in Africa and their, and their knowledge of so much about a African agriculture. Uh, there's an African NGO called the African Agricultural Technology Foundation based in Nairobi that leads it. And then the governments of Kenya, Uganda, uh, Mozambique, um, Tanzania and South Africa. Their own NARS scientists are very involved in really leading a lot of the efforts of developing the products. And it's generously funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Howard Buffett Foundation, and USAID. And this project was put in place seven, almost eight years ago because we recognized that farmers needed more resiliency to climate change and that one of the biggest barriers to farmers being able to um, to um, invest in better seeds, fertilizers, and other inputs was that risk of a drought. So even though droughts don't come every year, these farmers were, you know, need to be so risk averse that they wouldn't make those investments. So our goal with the project was to really understand how much um, 
how much drought tolerance do we need to provide so that they have more certainty that when the drought comes, they're going to at least break even on their investment, and then when the drought didn't come, they get that benefit of better hybrid seed yield and other inputs. And um, the, it's been, and now at this point, it's combining both breeding and biotechnology together. It's now the largest breeding program in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, Simit's germplasm has been combined with about 600 different drought-tolerant germplasm lines from Monsanto's collections around the world. And that's proven really, really impactful to bring a lot of benefit um, to, in, in terms of the, the hybrid yields. And we're really excited that the first hybrid actually was launched in Kenya last year. About 12,000 farmers received it. And here's the exciting part in my mind. The donations to the project were all royalty free. Um, and, the, and the seed is royalty free to the entire seed system of Africa. So any seed company, small or large, is encouraged to access this, these hybrids for their farmers. And um, the vision behind that was really trying to kickstart that um, seed system that we talked about, enable a lot of these smaller seed companies to be able to access some of the most innovative inventions and in R&D investment from around the world, including in Africa, for their, for their farmers. And our, um, we have a whole pipeline of new hybrids that are coming out. The hybrid that was launched last year had about a, I think the national average in Kenya was about 1.8 tons per hectare, and this one yielded 4.5 tons per hectare. They're, they're looking at about a 20 to 25 percent improvement already versus the most um, competitive hybrids in the marketplace under drought conditions. And we have a whole pipeline that hasn't even come. There's 70 hybrids in NPT1 trials and 40 in NP2 trials and 28 that are going to be launched next year. And they will have built in insect protection as well when the biotechnology part of it comes, comes through. That's in field trials today. So I, I, I share this with this group first to acknowledge the great um, collaboration that meant. I'll tell you for our company, it was a different kind of collaboration because corn and a lot of the, the both the hybrid lines and the um, biotechnology traits are pretty core to our business. So this wasn't something, it's one thing when we donate a trait or we or provide funding for a crop that we're not commercializing, which I think is very important. When it's a crop you're commercializing, it causes you to really have to look at um, finding that sweet spot between you know, protecting your business, but really providing as much as you can into a collaboration like this. And it's taught us a lot of really important things that I think we can build from in future collaborations. But I also share it because any of you who are seed companies or no seed companies in Africa, we encourage you to contact that NGO that is doing the licensing. That sounds pretty significant. I wonder, Claudia, is this the kind of initiative? You talked about the fact that for the foreseeable future, it's likely that public investment in research is, is going to be the way forward, particularly in the poorest countries, because the private sector doesn't prioritize them so much. I mean, it was a public-private partnership. So yes, right. I mean, that is for sure one of the ways forward. But you know, that is one big program started eight years ago, starting to yield benefits, 12,000 farmers. So we really need a lot more of that. I mean, I think that's the message I'm trying to say. And I didn't try to be too negative, but I'm. I felt there was far, far too much complacency in the first couple statements. And, and if, we really com if you're complacent, we won't get anywhere. And if we really have a goal of eradicating hunger by 2025, we, are, we will not currently get there unless we change, change the way we do business. And I know one, of the, er one, yeah. I know one of the areas you focus on is water and water scarcity. <laughs> um, this mm -hmm. is one program that looks to address that. Tell us where, where we are more broadly on water scarcity. You brought up a little bit of it before in terms of the Gulf states and others. Mm. Is this, are, you know, mm -hmm. they're going to run out of water in a few years. Where are we in sub-Saharan Africa in terms of water scarcity and, and what's mm. the future look like? Yeah. I mean, I guess it's similar to, you know, to, to other issues. Of course, you run out of water, but you can generate water. I mean, what the Gulf countries do, they generate water, you know, from, from, uh, from seawater, but obviously extremely high environmental cost, high energy cost, um, um, etc. But, but so, yes, generally, you know, water is becoming a growing constraint uh, to future food security. Um, Obviously, we are, you know, water already is competing with, I mean, water and irrigation is competing with all the other water users. We see all the urbanized, urbanized populations, um, you know, they drink double or triple the amount of water that we do in, in rural areas. 
There's also much, much more industrial development going on, which is good, of course. For example, in Africa, agro-processing, et cetera, et cetera. The value chain component, all of that needs a lot of water, which is not that, I mean, they don't consume it uh, directly, but you know, there's a question of, uh, of cleaning it, of treating it, so that's not happening anytime soon, also not in <laughs> urban areas. So the water is moving out of irrigation into those higher valued uses and the areas where irrigation is established and the other areas it's more difficult uh, to, to get, uh, to develop uh, storage for irrigation. Um, Africa is actually currently the, re the region that sees the fastest growth in irrigation development, among others, I guess, the very strong um, you know, increased focus of Africa on, on increasing agricultural productivity. So there is a lot of investment actually to store the water, which is also, again, very important um, to address climate change, climate variability. But overall, you know, despite uh, renewed drive to, to invest in, in storage, uh, we will see water uh, increasingly adversely affecting uh, productivity growth. So again, there's very little doubt there. It's a simple fact we have relatively stable water resource and we have a, a very unstable population and income growth. So it's growing, water is stable, so you can do the, the math. Uh, every year per capita water availability is declining. And again, we have technologies, there's strip sprinklers, uh, no-till, integrated soil fertility management, watershed management, a lot of technologies out there, but again, uh, you know, to actually get them to the people to roll them out takes time. So, so yes, water will increasingly affect um, Food, product, food production, productivity grows, and of course it's associated with energy. We generally need energy to, to generate water for irrigation. Um, we need energy to clean the water. Again, there's uh, technological innovations that can reduce that. Um, you know, uh, those closed cycling techniques, uh, even zero energy techniques. So it's out there, but we have to lower the costs and get them out there, especially to developing countries where all that growth is occurring. So we don't worry about maybe facing problems of increasing you know, irrigation in Europe or North America, that they can handle it. Farmers can buy the trip systems, but we, we, uh, we are worried about the developing countries there. And, and what about research? We, I want to hear your, your thoughts, and maybe you can answer this question too. Research priorities. Are we prioritizing the right issues, given what we've just heard? And, and please tell me your reaction as well to what Claudia just said. My reaction was to the, the, the complacence. <laughs> My, I mean, I'm generally, as, as people who know me in the, <laughs> the room, I'm usually very optimistic, yeah? and sometimes overly optimistic. When I say that, that increasing production by 50%, 60%, 70% over the next 30, 40 years is doable, I believe it is. It's possible. It's possible that I will win the lottery tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, it's not the um, same degree of possibility. Not, I hope. No, no, it, <laughs> it's not. But I mean, the, the the current the current approach to as far as agricultural RFD investments are concerned, and support really integrated, concerted support for agricultural development. If we continue at the current levels, no, we won't get there. But the thing is, there will be more food and fuel and finance crises, and that will put agriculture back on the agenda. It'll go uh, you know, up and down, up and down, up and down. That's the way it's likely to go, unfortunately. Yeah? If we can be a little bit more visionary and see that it's going to be a roller coaster ride and invest a little bit more now, then, you know, then it's much more doable. Yeah? So it's optimism with caution. Yeah? It's, and, and yeah. if we had the ability to invest more now, if we had the bigger budgets that we want, let's say, for public research, what should we focus on? What should the priorities be? I th well, there's a, lot, there's a lot of interrelated priorities. As far as there's still work to do as far as breeding is concerned, so genetic improvement both of livestock and of, uh, of crop species, we have to push those barriers. Yeah? Um, there's huge investments that can be, or improvements that can be made in uh, filling the, uh, meeting the yield gap, filling the, closing the yield gap. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's all about the context of agricultural development. When you look at what has happened in the Far East in Japan, what happened in Australia and New Zealand, what happened across Europe, what happened in the US, Agriculture for many, many decades has been one of the most planned and managed 
uh, economic and, and livelihood activities across the globe. Yeah, it, it's been it's been central to, and it still is central when you take a, uh, the European Union for an example. Um, Fifty percent or thereabout of the revenue, uh, tax revenue within Europe, goes into agricultural uh, production and subsidies. So, it, it, in many respects, you need some kind of you know whether it's a catap that really has that huge investment or the, a potentially huge investment uh, in it. It's not just about um, improved germplasm and improved agronomy. It's about improved value chains. It's about reducing risk to farmers. It's about getting the economics right. It's getting the pull right, yeah? And getting the supplies right, getting the, the seed of the highest quality or the good quality to the farmers at the right price at the right time. Um, having good quality fertilizer at the right price, all of that all has to come together. And that's about economics, it's about individual supply and, and, and output actors coming together, it's about getting the right policy environment and the right financial incentives within that. It's, it's, not, a, it's not an easy thing to do, it's, it's like a, a multi-ingredient cake that you have to get just right. Yeah. And people, people talk to me about you can't use, you know, you can't use market integration and, and, the, and weak input markets and weak output markets as, a, as an excuse for lack of uh, poor agricultural growth, ag agriculture sector growth. I think in many cases, those input and output markets are there, particularly in Africa, other parts of the world, but the robustness, the resilience yeah, of those marketing systems, those agricultural supply systems, is, is not as, as, as good as it could be or should be. Yeah? Well, you only have to look at uh, maize lethal necrosis in Eastern Africa. It's absolutely flawed, uh, the maize industry in that part of the world. Um, cassava, you know, brown streak, cassava mosaic disease, absolutely flawed cassava production in Nigeria. Um, you, you, can, you can get biotic and abiotic constraints that affect production systems in Europe, production systems in the US, but not to the magnitude that you would get, uh, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. Because so the systems are more those, resilient. Those systems are not as resilient. They're existing, yeah, but the resilience, if you like, we talk about climate uh, resilient. There's, to me, there's almost market resilience. Yeah? Maybe that's not the right technical term, Claudia, but I mean, that's, that's, that's how I perceive it. Yeah? Could I comment on the brown street? Please. And in fact, I'm about to turn to the audience. So let, why don't you get us started? And I'd, I'd love you to use a mic. I'm also concerned a little bit about the complacency here that, you know, all we have to do is maintain the rate of yield gain that we had in the past to go into the future. But there's some pretty intractable problems out there, which means even keeping yields at current level may be very difficult. We take the brown streak. The cassava brown streak was a minor problem on the coast of Tanzania. It's associated with an explosion of whitefly populations that's spreading westwards through Africa. Cassava brown streak is devastating cassava production. You go to Uganda, you see where, where it's come through. There's basically nothing left. Cassava's been taken out. And, and there isn't, there's no reasonable sources of host plant resistance. So it's a massive problem for breeding just to get just to keep those yields at the same level. So I, this just, all we have to do is continue. So, and there's other examples of very intractable problems which are becoming of increased importance. So we sh really shouldn't underestimate. Even keeping yields at the same level is going to be a huge challenge for us. And we need to be tapping into new biotech opportunities to manage some of these things. Or it's really hard to see how we're going to be able to even keep yields constant. So I think there was a little bit of complacency at the beginning. It seemed like... It's a, it's a language. No, but it's a, it's, it's a language issue. But, but you so, need to be careful with the language, but what, what gets picked up. I well, I agree, but here's the challenge. So we, we increased yields extraordinarily during the Green Revolution, uh, but we did it in part by doubling irrigation and bringing synthetic fertilizer to much of the world. So, ju quote, just keeping up with that rate of yield increase without doubling irrigation, which we can't do, and taking anything as fundamental as bringing fertilizer to much of the world is a huge challenge. So even before I start talking about your additional issues. Now I actually, um, I, I think there is a huge case for crop breeding. Part of the case is that 
a lot of the other investments that go into agriculture are facilitated by having crops that can be just good enough to utilize them and you get these virtuous cycles. So if you've got a big disease problem, you don't start doing all the other things until you've read something to deal with the disease problem. A second is that we have these new technologies. And the third is what you've just said. I mean, I am actually worried. I mean, there's a whole sector of kind of those who are critical of agriculture saying we rely too much on a limited number of crops. And I've always found that a little bit unrealistic because of path dependency. Once you learn how to produce maize, learn how to produce rice at very high yields, you keep going. And that's true in iPhones, it's true in cars, it's true in crops. But one of the results of that is we do are more dependent on a limited number of crops, which means we're more likely, combine that with climate change, we're more vulnerable than ever to diseases. And the way you deal with diseases is by having very rapidly um, adjusting breeding programs. I mean, that's really what you gotta do to deal with a lot of these diseases. So I completely agree with you. Um, you, you know, crop breeding uh, has clearly been taken way too much for granted. And, um, you know, I kind of come from the sectors that tend not to kind of call for just quote technological fixes, but you know, technological fixes go a long way. And in this case, you know, breeding is part of it. It's a, it's got to be a continuous, ongoing effort. I know the panel wants to respond further, but I want to get a few questions from the floor first together. Before we go any further, can you just tell us your name and organization, the person who asked the the first question? Can you pass it back? Maybe, maybe you know me because... Oh, no, I'm sorry. The person right behind you. We want to hear uh, his name. <coughs> My name? Yeah, Graham Teela. I'm with SIP, and I lead the CGA research program on rich students and bananas. So I've got a particular interest in cassava case. Obviously. Got it, got it. Okay. And, and I'll just ask for those of you who are about to ask your questions, please tell us your name and your organization. Try to keep it short, because we have limited time, and, and ideally with a question mark on the end would be fantastic. Please go ahead. Maybe, maybe you know me because um, I'm from UNCCD. United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification, and you have issued an, a piece of, uh, of article by Monique Barbu yes. in July, uh, reflecting on the SDGs and how it would be a failure to adopt the SDGs without land. Give me a minute, I tell you a small story. 30 uh, seconds, uh, quick, on, as quick as you can. On that. I'm from Burundi. Uh, my capital is uh, Bujumbura, and it is very common that if you ask the kids uh, where the milk is, is coming from, the, the kids will tell you it's from the bicycle. Not actually they're from the cow, but because they don't know the cow is in a can the countryside. Or if you ask some people here, the kids, where, are, where is the food from? they tell you from the supermarket. Because they don't know the food is actually come, come, coming from the land. I say it why, because um, we, we have been uh, discussing since yesterday the issue of uh, increasing food, food, the, the food production. And I, I say that agriculture is a downstream activity. We tend to look at the issues where they are, not upstream. What do we have up, upstream? Land. And frankly, when you, you, de, you discuss the issue of land degradation, it is as if it is like an alien notion. I am happy that uh, Commissioner Tomusime has, has, has responded to the question as to how to increase the food production by referring to land degradation neutrality. It is not a new religion. It's, it's very easy, easy to comprehend. One is to ensure that we don't destroy our land when we do agriculture. Don't, don't destroy it. The second is to reclaim degraded lands. We have millions of hectares out there begging for minimum investments to be, to be ready to be returned to the farm land status again. So the answer to the question, how? Can, can we feed nine, 9 billion people by 2050? I say simply, let's go land degradation neutral. Okay. So, so, so that we reclaim millions of lands we, 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 which are begging us to, to, you know, to, to bring them back to fertile status. So 
to help us to, to spread the, the news. We try. I'm the chief of UNSCD office here. I interact with delegations who, who, who write the SDGs. Now we have land degradation neutrality as one of the SDGs we have to adopt. Thank then you. Very, we very start good, the program. Point. We're going to come back to the panel. Thank to get you. Those. I want to take a few quickly together. So one in the front, and then I'm coming back to you, sir. Please Thank you. Name um, organization. My name is uh, Agnes Kalibata. Uh, I'm the president of AGRA, but I just want to speak from my previous experience as someone who was working on government side. First of all, I just want to, and I'm making reference to the point that uh, Commissioner Tumusime said, uh, and the question you asked regarding whether Af African governments and African countries were engaged enough. I mean, if you look at what has happened in the last 10 years, I don't think we've, we've seen any level of engagement that has been at that level in different countries. And the results are very clear. I mean, look at a country like Ethiopia that was going hungry several years ago, is now a breadbasket, is producing so much more and exporting. And several countries have fallen that trend. So there's a lot of engagement on the continent. There's a lot of commitment on the continent. There's a lot of leadership that comes from African Union. And, and I wonder whether we are actually tapping into this. I, honestly, I, I, I have to say that um, I've worked with IFPRI very closely, and I've seen this also yield very good results when it comes to providing leadership on helping government how to set and prioritize policies. I've seen that happen, and, and I appreciate that. So I'd like to know that we are all engaging that kind of way. Now, it takes me to my second point. My second point being only 25% of Africa's productive, I mean Africa's land, agricultural land, is only producing 25% of what should be producing. So back to your point, I think Africa is the only continent where you can produce 75% more food with minimum impact to the environment. Minimum impact to the environment. Because you get to do what you've done everywhere else and you have, it hasn't been done on this continent. So I believe that there's a huge room there for increased productivity with minimum impact. Now, third and last, the, the cost of us problem or these other problems that are happening. There's a whole lot that's happening because of climate change, I think. And, and I, I want to attribute the fast spread of all these diseases more to part of climate change and insect spread and all that than probably just saying that people are doing more cassava and, and more maize and, and whatever. I think that most of these problems have been there, but they're spreading faster. It's possible that they're spreading faster than they were spreading before. So again, because this is a CG, a CG consortium, I want to put a challenge to you. For me, the question is how quickly are we positioning ourselves to respond? Africa was at the very edge, and I'm saying was deliberately at the very edge of getting closer to a green revolution. But every time a farmer fails to get the yield that they were expecting because of, of climate change, it puts them one point or several points backwards. So how are we dealing with this? How are we helping adjust to these problems? How are we positioning ourselves to give farmers better options? Because they are going to go back. We are going to go back several miles if we don't do anything about it. If we just say, cast of a brown streak, yes, but, but the science behind it, we all have it in our hands. So for me, that's, again, don't, don't, don't worry about my agra hat yet, because I don't know what happens there yet. That's my future. You're the new interim <laughs> president Yes, of AGRA, right? yes. So but I'm, I'm speaking from my frustration as, as a person who was working in the government and seeing what we could do and what we could achieve in the agricultural sector. And I just get the sense that we are sometimes not, not responding fast enough, and yet we have the brains and the technologies sitting somewhere. Great, great yeah, point. I sorry. appreciate it very much. Actually. I have to go. I'm sorry. This, just can you pass the mic back to this gentleman? Sorry. One, one behind you. We're going to take okay. this last question in this round, and then we're going to go to the panel and come back for more. Thanks. Sir, your name uh, I'm your Lawrence name. Kent with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And um, I, I guess I'm concerned the four most important uh, locally grown crops in terms of staple crops in sub-Saharan Africa, millet, sorghum, cassava, and maize. In terms of the adoption of, of new varieties, the products of agricultural research, in millet and sorghum, it's probably less than 
97% of what people are growing are land races that they've been growing since the time of their great-grandfathers. Uh, when we look at uh, cassava, uh, places like Tanzania, probably again 95% of what people are growing are traditional land races. There's been very little adoption of improved cultivars. Even in Nigeria, uh, where there's been huge efforts, and IITA is based, probably over 75% of the varieties that the farmers are growing are still the land races that their great-grandparents grew. So there's been a lot of talk at this, on this panel about the importance of investing in, in R&D, and, and I sort of say, why? You know, there's, there's nothing coming out that's being adopted. And, and you were talking earlier, uh, Dave, about how you know, to make a cake, you need a lot of different ingredients, but you have to put them in proportion. And if you're putting in a lot of flour and you're not putting in any yeast or any sugar, you're not going to get a good cake. And if you can only afford so much flour, save some money for some sugar, right? And so what, I, what, what I'm frustrated with is those institutions that drive adoption are not having conferences like this and are not receiving the funding and support that they need to make the seed systems work, to supply the seeds, to make the fertilizer systems supply the fertilizer or the herbicides or the other inputs. Because we're not going to achieve these improvements in productivity until farmers use higher levels of inputs. And right now it's pathetic. It's nine kilograms per, per hectare per year for fertilizer use in sub-Saharan Africa and virtually no adoption of improved varieties for the most important food crops. Of course we're not going to get doubling of productivity if that continues. But I don't know if we need to put more money into the CG to achieve that or do we need to find those, those missing institutions that are really good at driving adoption, uh, the seed systems, the fertilizer systems, the input delivery systems? W where are they? How can we find them and, and fund them to be more successful? That's my question. Great question. We've had three very provocative points. I know everyone in the panel wants to get in. Um, we had from our colleague from Burundi, Melchiade, he uh, talked about land degradation. So that's the key. And neutrality around land, reclaiming land that's been degraded. Uh, Agnes, the president, the interim president of Agra, is talking about are we engaging governments enough? There, there's been 10 years of success, she thinks, in many ways. And she says only 25 percent. Uh, productivity of land in sub-Saharan Africa, so can't we, and I think this gets to Lawrence's point, can't we do more just around using the basics? And Lawrence provocatively asked, should we just focus more on adoption and less on research? Uh, Natalie, I know you wanted to respond to some of this. Could you kick us off? Sure. Well, um, the other thing this, the gentleman raised was um, the conversation that's taking place with people who don't know as much about agriculture. And that is influencing policy around the world. And it's certainly, it's, it's influencing a lot of different decisions. And if you look at the cassava project, you know, you referenced, there's a biotechnology, humani you know, public sector project that may never reach a farmer if we're not able to overcome some of those kind of um, perception barriers. And I had my launch onto Twitter this week. This week. Um, I just entered the social media Welcome. sphere. <laughs> And I don't know what all I've been doing to people with hashtags and things like that as I figure it out. But one thing that I was pretty shocked by was how many young people started following me pretty quickly and retweeting things and adding in their own thing. And there's a lot of interest by younger people around the world about food security. I think it's more than when I was younger. I think it's more than moms my age are. Um, they're, they're, they see themselves more as global citizens, and they think there should be equality for everyone, and they believe that business can be a power for good. And they think it should, they need to hear, I think, um, the real importance, when I was younger, I kind of grew up with the perception that public sector was good and private sector was bad, <laughs> here I am today. Um, but I think that's, that kind of perception, it took me a long time to figure out, we need them both, it's not an either or. And I think we don't have time for the next generation to take that time to figure that out. And we need them to be understanding that different kinds of tools have a fit in different kinds of situations. And I can speak for the private sector. I want them to know that they should expect to hold companies accountable for thinking about how they're building sustainability into their operations. That meaning, how can they bring more benefit to society while they're growing their business. There are win-wins out there, and, they, and we should be held and expected to do that. So as we're growing our business in different places, it's not just about doubling yields or, or what. It's about how do we do that 
while conserving resources and taking care of the ecosystem. Some of that's going to be our own research. A lot of it won't, and we're going to need other people's research. So a goal like the gentleman brought up around zero land degradation. Um, the, I think the next point is it's, it's, hard, it's hard to set that goal. And with policy, I understand that. It's something to aspire to, that kind of a goal. But I think the other track we can take at the same time is to help different organizations that are contributing to these solutions understand what could that mean for them. Even if it's not a, you know, a public policy goal and we can't get it to that, we can look at that as a company and say, what role can we play in trying to minimize any kind of degradation? And we need help understanding what that really would mean for us, because we don't know all those answers. But that kind of collaboration is the kind of collaboration I, I think we need. And I certainly don't mean to imply any sense of complacency around my original comments. But my feeling is we have no choice but to be optimistic. There's really no room for cynicism. Um, but I do think that there needs to be much, much more collaboration. And I think the voice of this community that understands food security and the complexities needs to enter the debate and the discussion of the next generation that has a lot of interest in this, but might not know nearly so much about agriculture and the complexities, especially for smallholders around the world. Thank you. And Claudia, can you take this on and respond particularly directly to Lawrence. I'm interested in your thoughts on that. Sorry, which one was Lawrence? I just wrote down the, the topics, not the Gates names. Foundation. Oh, okay, okay. I mean, I mean, first, your neighbor obviously should respond on cassava, right? <laughs> Didn't he say he needs a program on roots and tubers? Um, but, I mean, just to make it clear, in so 2008, when we have the last, you know, compatible international numbers on, on public agriculture research, CGR was 700 million and global public funding for agricultural research was 32 billion. So just to, to keep it in mind, we are extremely small drop in the bucket. So where should the bucket go? Of course, you know, towards we should focus on, on, on poor countries, but we need the we need the complementary investment by the national agricultural research systems. And if you, I mean, I, I'm not an expert. <clears throat> I'm actually a water expert, but in terms of which national agricultural research systems in Africa have set Cassava, millet, and sorghum is my first priority. I'm, I'm not aware. Maybe Rhoda can tell us. I have a feeling that there is a misalignment in the national agricultural research systems on you know, which crops they should focus on. But we also have to be aware you know, that food demand is moving out of millet, sorghum, and, and, and cassava. So if you ask these you know, increasingly urbanizing people what do you want to eat, it's rice and bread, wheat. So and then when we talk about investments, cut of investments. All these ministers of agriculture, irrigation, they say, we want to irrigate our own rice. We don't want to import it from Vietnam. That's what they say. They don't say, we want to be the best cassava producer in the world. I haven't heard that yet. So uh, this is very general statements, of course. Each country is different. There are some strong programs. And again, your neighbor will uh, tell you more about it. And not everyone wants to say, we want to be you know, self-sufficient in rice. But these are some of the general developments. So it's not all. And we are not pushing, you know, we are not supposed to push research out. I mean, it's demand driven. So but I, think, I think there's I think, a lot of aspects Claudia, there. I think yeah. Lawrence's point, and maybe Tim, mm -hmm. you can jump in on this too, yeah. is that it's not so much that we necessarily need the new research. We need to take what's already been developed mm -hmm. and adopt it. Yeah. It's adoption that's the, sure. the challenge, if, if I understood Lawrence correctly. Mm -hmm. The last mile delivery, that's the challenge. Yeah. Tim, Tim, can you speak to that? Mm -hmm. Well, it's all of the above. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. Here's what we know. We know that poor farmers, given a new technological option that produces a 50% rate of return on investment or a 100% rate of return on investment, adopt it unbelievably fast. And we know that when we do calculations and we say you get a 10% rate of return, why don't all the farmers do it? They don't adopt it because there's a lot of risk. And so you, well, how do you then reduce the cost? Well, if, you could, if, if, if fertilizer costs are lower, that changes the calculation and you can adopt a technology that requires the fertilizer. If disease risks are lower, that changes the calculation. All of these things work to change the calculation, and at some point the calculation becomes good enough that everyone does it quickly. So, you know, your Gates Foundation is working on all the things that need to be worked on in some way, or a lot of the things that need to be worked on in some way, and the question is getting it all to that right, to that right mix. But I do think crop breeding is a big part of it. I don't know enough, really. I mean, it's a good question with sorghum and millet. You know, we know that people grow sorghum and millet in, in part because 
it does okay in marginal lands with low investments, you know. And so the question is, well, why aren't they, we need analyses, maybe they exist, but I haven't studied those, of why those particular breeds that could produce 20% more, 30% more aren't adopted. So I'll, I'll just say my last little pitch on this. Um, you know, to systematically think about these things, you've got to have uh, analysis at kind of the farm level and categorize it by these costs. What is technically doable and what are the costs of doing it? And in, the, in, in some of the major crop sectors, the level of information available is dramatically better, right? You can say, okay, grow this. This is the maize variety with this input in this place. At least, it may not be perfect, whatever, but it's... If you ask that about agroforestry, if you ask that about sorghum, uh, if you ask that about uh, livestock improvements, and remember, livestock are still a huge factor, even in Africa. We don't have remotely. I mean, at the high-tech level, yes, but in for, for kind of small, smaller farmers, or we don't have that. And that's a kind of a level of information we have to take seriously. I think there, if, 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 when, when we think about kind of climate-smart agriculture, it's these, there are issues that we care about more because of the climate, and that may be because of resilience and adaptation, or it may be because of mitigation in the sense like, well, it, why, don't you, why do we let land degrade? It's because you can plow up new land. But if you care about the environment, you don't want to plow up new land. So now all of a sudden you care about that more. So you have to pay more attention to land degradation than you have in the past. So because of that, there are all kinds of things that we need to spend more attention doing. And part of the thing is to get the information base to the level of actual practical decision making, which of course you have in the maize sector and you have in, in these other sectors. Uh, not that it didn't need to be improved and continually adapted. So I, I'll just leave it at that, at that gap. There's whole sectors of agriculture where we don't, where we don't have that level of kind of information delivery. So there may be, need to be more research not necessarily on new varieties, but on how to adopt and, and, and in where, which place and, and where are the gaps and what are the real costs and what's the real story of why sorghum variety isn't adopted in one particular place. I, I don't know the answer. I'm going to give uh, Rhoda and Dave a chance quickly, if, if both of you can, to respond in any way you like to this. And then I'm hoping we'll have a minute to go back to other people in the audience who are already five minutes over. So please, please go ahead, Rhoda. I think the guest foundation um, uh, question on uh, what are the missing links, I think uh, that one is very critical because uh, if you look at, for example, the input delivery systems, uh, you look at uh, how does the farmer really access uh, these inputs. However much you have uh, a technology which is going to be adapted, the farmer will not be able to do that because the accompanying components are not readily available. So there are, I think, uh, areas which have to be focused on a little bit more and see um, how do we regulate, how do we regulate this, how do we get the in the farmer's uh, field, and I mean, t t nearer to the farmer. And then, uh, then how do we get the output market sorted out? Because a farmer would be able to, uh, to respond, I mean, to, to adopt the technology. But why should I adapt the technology when I'm not able to market what I would have produced? So there are many areas which I think we all can contribute to uh, in this area. Then also uh, earlier on there was talk about uh, the, the diseases of cassava. Uh, in fact, in Uganda, the, the banana is being wiped out. But I see uh, quite a lot of uh, area where really the research can can come in, breeding systems can be improved on to be able to, uh, to get uh, this, these diseases addressed. And I see now there's a lot of response on searching for what can we do to see how to get the banana wilt out of, uh, of Uganda. But if the disease is not there, there's, I think, complacency because people don't, they don't breed, the breeding system just collapses. But I think there's more which can be done and uh, I see that the, the, the science is now improving more and more, and the plant rates for banana are now being accessed by farmers in trying to respond or to counteract the, the disease uh, which has uh, uh, really ravaged uh, the banana uh, plant in Uganda. So in a nutshell, I, I would like to say that, uh, of course, prioritization of a few 
crops like cassava and millet and, and sorghum and whatever are important. But then we must have a structured approach to these uh, commodities. Because unless a commodity has got uh, all the, the accompanying uh, uh, components of extension, of inputs, of markets, then adoption still will be low. And then you'll find that it, it, there are questions. Why aren't farmers adapting? So that's why it takes a partnership. Uh, the, the, the research must come to the policymakers, and the policymakers also should search for information from research. So it takes two, I think, to tango. Okay, thank you. Dave, please. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure about, uh, again, the, the crops, the, the millet and the, the sorghum. I mean, most, most of the discussions that, uh, that I've been party to have prior, prioritized uh, rice, wheat, maize, cassava has been the, the kind of big, uh, the big crops. And, and again, the, the limited amount, it depends where you are, but in some areas, you know, adoption of modern varieties produced in partnership with the CGR, maybe 30% or thereabouts, maybe 15 to 30%, depending where, where you are. So very low adoption is, is, is quite rare. Um, as, as far as... It depends. Is percent of people still growing old varieties? That's, no, that's no, but, well, yes and no. Yes and no. I mean, the, 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 bot the bottom line with um, the CGR traditionally, its role in the, the linear model of research to development has, to be, is to be, has been to produce the technologies, which has traditionally been improved germplasm. And then national systems, <coughs> private sector, whoever is expected to take it on from there, and farmers are expected to adopt. We know that that you know, in some cases it worked, in many cases it didn't work. We're now focusing much more on better targeting uh, the research that we do for the right technologies for the right farmer, working with those farmers to better understand what they, they need. So the approach has changed. Yeah? We're, not, we're not using a, a unilinear approach. Now, whether you're, what you say about the, the focus on research, research is very important, and investing in research is very important, primarily for tomorrow rather than today. We can take a lot of what's already on the shelf and we can provide a, a policy and economic incentive environment to get a lot of those technologies into use in partnership, admittedly. But in the long term, if you don't invest now, in agricultural research for development, you're not going to have the technologies for the future. And those technologies are going to be central to food security for the globe. Now, the balance between hey, what, hey, what should go into... In you know, 50 years of investment in Icrasad and Millet and Sorghum, 45 years of investment in cassava research mm -hmm. and IITA, and we're still at these pathetically low levels of adoption. You seem to say, oh, give us another 50 years? No. <laughs> No, uh, my, my, last, my last kind of uh, response in many respects is that at the end of the day, research for development should be a small portion of the pie. Yeah? I don't know, off the top of my head, maybe 10, 15 percent of total investment. The lion's share should go into those development components. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Getting all of that together. Karen wants to add. Maybe she's got some specific statistics. Right, we've got um, very little time left. But it's, it's that balance, yeah? No, but, but we're, heading, we're heading more in that direction. We have 30% that goes straight through to partners, if not more, in the May CRP. Yeah. Well, Lawrence, you brought up a very provocative point, which I promise we at DevX will continue to cover. So read more about it, but we've, we've got minutes left. So can the mic be passed to this gentleman in the front who's been waiting patiently? Then we're going to go to you in the back, and then we've got a couple here on the left we're coming to as well. Yeah, I have Three two questions, again, one to Dave and another to Natalie. Specific to Dave and his building from this discussion. Your name and organization. My name is Boaz. I work with the African Union Commission. My specific question to Dave, there has been a lot of debate and recent discussions along the private sector to be part of the research system. And from the CGI, how do you see this? Because I think some countries in Africa are beginning to legislate to allow the private companies to be part of multiplication distribution of seed. 
maybe the challenge that is being discussed here is as a result of concentrating the public institutions in multiplication of seed. How do you see that evolving? And then the question to Natalie, as Monsanto, there is a lot of increasingly debate and concern around the global companies in Africa and the potential to crowd out or move away the small, medium, private seed distribution companies. What is your experience, especially in the countries that you've been working in? And I, do you see specific instruments that countries are creating to protect and give space for the domestic companies to be part of that development? What's your own experience? Thank you. Can you pass the mic straight back? I'm Karen Brooks. I'm with IFPRI. I'm the um, director of the uh, CGI, our research program on policies, institutions, and markets. Just a very quick point. I think it's great that this issue of should we juxtapose um, investment in research versus investment in adoption or you know, the, the other parts of the innovation system? And the answer is no. Right now, it is really, really important to message the importance of investing in agricultural research in Africa. Now that heads of state are focusing on the science agenda for Africa, they're turning their attention to that. They need to be encouraged to actually follow through and remedy the underinvestment in agricultural research that's taken place over the last 20 years. That is really, really important. But at the same time, we need higher returns to the research, and that means we have to link it up with the rest of the innovation system. So, you know, the two things really important. Invest in agricultural research and do what you need to do to get the higher return. And they're both doable. Okay, thank you. Can I ask you to pass the mic to the back row? And then we're coming to this gentleman here. Sure. Uh, Joshua Levin from the World Wildlife Fund. And if, if we want more research and policy support for the type of work you're doing, I'm wondering where are we at uh, in terms of more macro level research on the overall impact of climate change on pest outbreaks, therefore impacting yields as well as uh, unexpected weather events, and also on the political and economic destabilization resulting from uh, these types of impacts on yields. So more macro level effects that would actually impact the military, the Department of State, institutional investors, uh, and our global relationships. And I think that let's stop underestimating the risks that we're facing from the food system. Great point. Can you pass the mic up here to the front? My name is Adama Traore. I am presently the interim DG for Africa Rice. So I think we should be optimistic because what I have heard, I think the chair from uh, Agra just leave the room. And we are pleased as Africa Rice Center to belong to the CG Center and also to be an intergovernmental organization from 25 countries. And if I see the trend, we are very optimistic because the government are investing in the last 10 years much more in their agricultural research system, investing in the sector. It is true that the situation is very different from a, one crop to another crop. And as someone said, we had a look to have a food crisis and the rice sector take over from this cross, uh, food crisis, and a lot of investment was done. I think what will make the difference is the CG Center are now doing or will do research totally in a different phase, a different way. As he said, now we use the innovations uh, platform approach, the chain value approach, and all this enable not only just to produce technology, being able to interact with all the other actors to enable them to take over the technology. Without an enabling environment, no uptake of technology. It is clear, the access, linking the world to the market, a lot of things will change in the next 10 years, and I am sure Knowing the knowledge, the scientific knowledge, 
and the new approach to do research that in the future we will be able to overcome a lot of challenges. And not investing in research, I think we are proud about what we have already produced, but it is very necessary that we continue to invest in research. As we say, we are investing, we can do better, and we should also do research for the future, not just for the technology that we have now. And the issue of the climate change and a lot of other new issues are very important. So I... We've really got a wrap. Really little, really little. Uh, yeah, my name is Salambi Kongolo. Uh, I'm a faculty in the U.S. and I teach in the Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo. Yeah, uh, my question is, uh, what is the impact of a CGR, I mean, in agriculture development in Africa? Because, you know, we've been there for many, many years. Okay, provocative question. For, and, and let me just say, we are, we are now well over time. I think this, the, the panel is obviously dynamic, bringing up lots of great issues. This is going to be our chance to wrap up. So a very quick statement for each of you to wrap up and address anything you'd like to address. Uh, and just a, a very brief reminder of what we've heard about. Um, you know, our, our multinational companies crowding out small companies. Um, we heard about the need for both research and adoption and perhaps for focusing that research in new ways that leads to better adoption. Um, and then from the World Wildlife Fund from Joshua, we heard about kind of looking at this as beyond a crops issue, but a much broader macro issue. If you have climate change, if you have pests, if you have lack of water, it's at a level that should affect, you know, it should, should rise to a much higher level than perhaps we're, we're debating it at this point. So, Claudia, can you start us off? We're going to do very quick wrap-ups. Um, so in terms of crowding out um, national, local companies, I mean, you, you need to develop strong regulatory systems in the country. So it can be managed. And again, it's a question of what the governments want to see on the ground and what they want to do. And in terms of uh, pest and mac macro assessments, we have done several studies, um, you know, global climate change impacts on water and food, and I'll link you, I, I can give you some references. Uh, there's still a complete underinvestment in research on, on a future pest and disease, some work going on at some of the centers, also ECP. Um, you, I'm not sure if you've heard of that center. Um, so yes, I think there's a lot of rudimentary work going on, but it's extremely difficult to, to get that right. Um, We've also looked into that a little bit, but more work has to be done in, in the pest and disease area as it relates to, to climate variability and climate change. So those just very two quick points. I would love to say a lot more about agricultural technologies. We actually haven't talked much about them, but I think we kind of ran out of time. It will have to save itself for a future yeah. panel. Please, yeah. Natalie. Um, to the gentleman's question. So we really want to see a vibrant seed system where farmers have a lot of choices and we have to compete for their business. Um, but we are a company that's investing a lot more in R&D than a lot of other companies can, smaller companies. Mm -hmm. The model that we've used around the world is a very broad licensing model. So if you look at the United States, there's over 200 seed companies ranging from our largest competitor to very small mom and pop type seed companies that license our technology. And, um, we have great partnership with them. We work with them on what their needs are. This is the part of the business that my husband actually works in. So he's got a number of seed companies where his goal is helping to make them successful licensing our technologies. Um, we've done the same approach in Africa or in uh, India. And I would say in Africa, it's a similar approach, except we've done it in a way that it, uh, through this WEMA project with the idea that the NGO is the licensee, the licensor. All the intellectual property is with the NGO. The idea, again, is that all these other, all C companies of whatever size can be accessing that um, investment that was made by all the partners. Um, my closing remarks, I think, would be um, just to encourage that I really think this is a unique moment in time where you see a more alignment and convergence than ever before on the big challenges of climate change and food security with different sectors coming together. I think the question from the gentleman from the World Wildlife Fund is a really important one. Um, I think what's important for us is to think about the strengths of our different sectors and how we can best complement each other at this point. The private sector is really trying to focus on what can they do to address these kind of challenges through their business 
R&D mechanisms, through their different kinds of business practices, through where they're investing. There's information that they're going to need as they're trying to do that to, in a way that we've all talked about, that macro data being one of them. Um, and, and I think it's a really important time for us all to come together and look at what our respective strengths are and how we can best complement each other with the resources that are available. Thank you. Very tiny question. You took a little bit more time than I did. Um, so basically, but we, we did come to, I just want to add that we did come together not because we proactively thought each other out. We, we are coming together, environment, energy, water, food, because we have no choice, because we are negatively impacted. I just want to make that clear because otherwise it sounds, again, you know, we, we really have challenges here. So I just wanted to make that clear. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. I thought Thank the you. comments were good. I, I you. <laughs> Thank you. Rhoda. Yeah, I can conclude by saying that uh, for us in Africa, our target is to double agricultural productivity within the next 10 years. And uh, you have seen this one in the commitment of our leaders. So the challenge, and also maybe to answer his question, is for research to position itself to answer or to make an input into all these uh, targets so I say, yeah, our contribution to this is this, our science agenda. So can we double our cultural productivity by adapting modern technologies? This is my concluding remark. Thank you. Dave? I just wanted to respond to two things. I'll start with the defensive one, because I don't want to finish with the defensive one. <laughs> I want to finish with a really open, positive one. Um, the impact of the CGI, it, it's, it, impact assessment has been documented widely for the last 20, 30 years, both by internal impact assessment uh, teams and external independent uh, impact assessment teams. Um, one of the biggest impacts of the CGR has been uh, the biocontrol programs of IITA. You were talking about IITA before, and that's very well documented. A lot of donors still place their, their investments in, in agricultural research in the CGR because of the high rates of return um, on, on that, those investments. So I, I, that's my defense case, and I, I'm leaving it at that. Um, to finish on a very positive note, and I can't remember who uh, raised the question about what, what is the CGR doing to partner with the private sector. We have Monsanto here. As far as uh, Maze is concerned, we're partnering with virtually all of the, the big global corporations in, in Maize and Wheat. Um, and at the other end of the scale, because we, we go right the way down to community-based organizations in, in Maize particularly, uh, we have on the books active... Um, collaborations with more than 150 SME, small to medium sized enterprise seed companies, which we're working on a daily basis with. These are ongoing collaborations. Yeah? So that's my finishing on and up. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dave. Well, as I said at the outset, there are, no, there are few issues that rise to this importance. And I thank you for bringing your passion and your knowledge to this today, to this great discussion. We will continue to cover it at DevX. We're thrilled to be a media partner of this event, and we look forward to uh, continuing to work with you.